I'm Catherine Petchprapa, and this is the talk about osteoporosis. What is it? How do you diagnose it? And what is the future of osteoporosis assessment? Osteoporosis is a common disorder of reduced bone strength that predisposes to an increased risk of fracture. It affects over 200 million people worldwide and one third of all postmenopausal women in the US and Europe. Now, bone strength depends on many things, primarily bone quality, including bone microarchitecture, rate of turnover and underlying damage, and bone quantity or bone density, which accounts for 60 to 70 percent of bone strength. Once peak bone mineral density is achieved in the late 20s, bone mineral density declines with age. In women, the rate of decline accelerates at menopause. It's important to note that bone mineral density also declines in men. However, men have an overall higher baseline bone mineral density when compared to women, and the decline is much more slow and steady. Bones are made up of trabecular and cortical bone, and the differential loss of trabecular and cortical bone over time is reflected in the type of incidence of fracture seen. Vertebral and forearm fractures are common early on in the disease. These are predominantly made of trabecular bone, which is most affected early on. Hip fractures increase with increasing age due to loss of both trabecular and cortical bone, and fracture risk increases exponentially as bone mineral density decreases. At least 40% of osteoporotic women and up to a third of osteoporotic men will develop at least one fragility fracture in their lifetime. And these fragility fractures are defined as low trauma fractures uh, which commonly occur in the wrist, spine, and hip. Having a fragility fracture significantly increases your risk of another fragility fracture. Osteoporotic fractures are associated with death, disability, and significant costs to the population. These costs are estimated to be in the billions. And this is not only for the treatment of fracture, but for the treatment of osteoporosis. So how do we diagnose osteoporosis? Once upon a time, plain films were used to diagnose osteoporosis. Osteoporotic bone has less calcium and therefore absorbs less x-rays. This causes them to appear more radiolucent. However, this is not a very sensitive finding, as nearly 50% of the bone must be lost for the bone to appear this way. The thickness of the cortex will also diminish with osteoporosis, and measurements of cortical thickness have been used to diagnose osteoporosis. Cortical thickness measurements were most commonly used in the metacarpal bones in the hand, and the bones were considered demineralized if the sum of the cortical thickness was less than half of the widths of the bone's diameter. Loss of cortical thickness can also be seen in other anatomic sites, as you can see here in a patient with low-energy fracture of the radius. The radial cortex is thin compared to that of a normal young adult at peak bone mineral density. Changes in trabecular pattern have also been studied. One of the places where altered trabecular pattern can be seen is in the proximal femur, where progressive loss of bone mineral density results in a predictable loss of tensile and compressive trabeculae. This is called the Singh index. However, the trabecular pattern in the proximal femur isn't always well seen, even when normal, and it has been shown that this does not correlate with measured bone mineral density. The presence of telltale fractures can help raise the concern for osteoporosis. These telltale fractures or insufficiency fractures can occur in characteristic places such as in the pelvis, uh, seen here in the sacrum at the puboacetabular junction, the parasymphyseal pelvis, and inferior pubic ramus. Osteoporotic fractures also occur in the spine where they are seen as biconcave end plate compression deformities early on, which may progress onto significant loss of height. Detecting these telltale fractures is very important and should prompt an evaluation of the patient's bone mineral density. Now, as we said, 60 to 70 percent of bone strength is dependent on bone mineral density, and this can be measured using DEXA. DEXA is the most widely available and used technique to quantify bone mineral density and diagnose osteoporosis in the clinical practice. It stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry and is a technique that uses an X-ray source with two energies to differentiate between hydroxyapatite and bone and soft tissue. It is used to measure the bone density in the proximal femur, the spine, and the forearm, where the majority of fragility fractures occur. It is an extremely low-dose technique with a dose equivalent of spending half a day in the sun. It is the most widely validated technique to evaluate bone mineral density, and the World Health Organization defines osteopenia and osteoporosis based on bone mineral density measurements by DEXA.
However, it isn't like a pregnancy test where a single dip can accurately determine if you are or aren't osteoporotic. In fact, so much can go wrong with the process and interpretation. A study in European radiology in 2015 found that more than 90% of DEXA exams had at least one error, and these were mainly of data analysis, which falls on us. Therefore, it's our job to make sure that DEXA is an accurate and reproducible test so that we can diagnose osteoporosis, help predict fracture risk, and determine uh, therapeutic intervention, as well as monitor response to therapy or change with time. So let's get comfortable with our DEXA exam and take a closer look at the tabular data here obtained in a postmenopausal woman. In the third column is bone mineral content in grams. Bone mineral content in grams divided by the area in centimeters squared yields the bone mineral density in grams per centimeter squared. This brings me to a very important point, and that is that DEXA provides an aerial bone mineral density measurement, meaning that it is the measured mineral content within a defined area. This area is defined by the region of interest placed by the machine or the technologist, and the larger the area, potentially the greater measured bone mineral density that you'll get. Now, while ROI placement may differ between DEXA manufacturers, proper and consistent ROI placement is critical for measurement accuracy and reproducibility. For the rest of this talk, I'll be referring to the hologic-based systems. Hologic femoral ROI placement is shown here. Femoral neck, trochanter, and intertrochanteric measurements are used to give you the total measurement. The inferior edge of the global ROI box should lie one centimeter below the lesser trochanter. The femoral neck box corner should touch the junction between the trochanter and upper outer femoral neck and must only contain the femoral neck which is centered in this box. The patient must also be positioned properly with the hip internally rotated 15 to 25 degrees such that the lesser trochanter is barely seen. The femoral shaft should be vertical and straight in the image and the bone margin should be well defined by the bone map. Here's an example of an improperly positioned hip showing inadequate internal rotation and hip abduction. Proper hip positioning is so important. A study showed differences in measured bone mineral density in a cadaver, which was affected by differences in hip positioning. Measurements of the spine are obtained with with the patient supine, with the hip and knees flexed over a cushion to straighten the lumbar lordosis. The resultant, resultant image should look like this. The spine is centered in the field of view. The image includes the lowest ribs and the iliac crests so that you can confidently identify the L1 through L4 levels and there are no artifacts in the field of view. L1 through L4 levels must be correctly identified with horizontal lines going through the center of each disc space, which helps to correct for the scoliosis. The L1 and L4 levels are measured. The area of the vertebral bodies generally increases as you go from L1 through L4, and the individual T-scores should be within one T-score measurement of each other. If there is greater than one T-score difference between the two adjacent levels, take a closer look at the image to see what may be causing the discrepancy. You only need two levels for analysis. Levels with greater than one T-score difference or levels which may be affected by ossifites, bone sclerosis, or artifacts may be excluded. Forearm DEXA can be used in addition to or as an alternative to central DEXA. It can be done when the spine and hips cannot be accurately measured. This may occur if there is metal hardware in the hip or spine. It can also be done if the patient is over the weight limit of the table as the patient is positioned in a chair next to the scanner. Forearm DEXA is also preferred in the setting of hyperparathyroidism as bone loss in primary hyperparathyroidism primarily occurs in the cortex. In the hologic system, the distal line in the forearm box is located at the ulnar styloid and the ultradistal region must not include the radial end plate. The one-third radius, or the 33% radius, measures cortical bone loss, and it is the area used for diagnosis. Many, many mistakes can occur in terms of patient positioning and ROI placement, and these can significantly affect the measured bone mineral density. Here are some examples in the hip. Errors can also occur in spine DEXA, including misidentifying the L1 through L4 levels, including more than one level uh, in a region of interest, including a level which includes an artifact,
including levels that have been affected by surgery or including levels that have been affected by a compression fracture. Now let's look further on our tabular data. We see two columns called T-score and Z-score. Now osteoporosis is based on T-score, not absolute bone mineral density, with the T-score representing the number of standard deviations from the mean compared to a young adult at peak bone mineral density, and a Z-score representing the number of standard deviations from the mean for a person of the same age. The patient's data is compared to a manufacturer-based gender and ethnically matched reference database for the lumbar spine and forearm, so it's important that the technologist enters this information correctly. In the hip, the NHANES data is used for comparison. The World Health Organization defines a T-score of minus 2.5 or less as osteoporosis, and these patients are indicated for treatment. A score between minus 1 and minus 2.5 is considered low bone mass or osteopenia. And as it turns out, the majority of osteoporotic fractures occur in osteopenic patients simply because there are many more osteopenic patients than osteoporotic patients as defined by the bell curve. How do we stratify those osteopenic patients at greatest risk? Two useful tools are FRAX and VFA. FRAX is a risk assessment tool that combines the femoral neck DEXA results with risk factors to calculate a 10-year probability of bone fracture risk in untreated men and women between the ages of 40 and 90. Using FRAX, the risk for major osteoporotic fracture and hip fracture can be assessed. The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends treatment in patients in whom FRAX 10-year fracture risk is greater than 20% for major osteoporotic fracture or greater than 3% for hip fracture. Vertebral fracture assessment is a method in which potentially clinically silent osteoporotic fractures can be detected. This can be done at the same time as the DEXA exam and has a much lower dose than conventional radiographs. Vertebral body fractures are often undetected by clinicians because they are asymptomatic, because back pain is common and not always related to fracture, and height loss and kyphosis is common in the elderly. Unfortunately, vertebral body fractures are underdiagnosed by radiologists, and studies have shown only 50% of vertebral body osteoporotic fractures were reported by radiologists, and imaging has nearly 50% false negative rate. The most important thing about osteoporotic vertebral body fractures is that they, can, they are an independent risk factor for other fractures, and the presence of these fractures can be enough to treat osteoporosis. Now, how do you monitor bone mineral density change over time? It has been shown that at least two years have to go by to detect a statistically significant change in aerial bone mineral density. In order to determine if a change is statistically significant and a biologic change, we need to do a precision assessment and assess how well a single technologist or a group of different technologists in a group can reproduce the same result. The result of a precision assessment is the least significant change. If we look at our exam, we can see that the least significant change at this facility is 0.033 grams per uh, cm squared. And if the difference between the measured bone mineral density at two times points is greater than that, then the change is considered statistically significant. If the change is less than the least significant change, then the difference in measured bone mineral density is not considered statistically significant. We already saw how differences in ROI placement and patient positioning can affect the measured bone mineral density. Differences in ROI placement and patient positioning on serial exams can also result in errors in comparison. It's very important to compare the images from exams to ensure that patient positioning and ROI placement match before making a comparison. So DEXA is a good test, but we've already seen that it's not perfect. What else do we have? QCT uses CT to measure bone mineral density over a defined volume. Some advantages of QCT are that it will not be affected by overlying artifact or osteophytes, and it can selectively evaluate trabecular bone. The bad news is that the radiation dose is much greater. While the WHO definition is still based on DEXA, the ACR has established threshold equivalents for QCT, which can be used for diagnosis. The information from QCT can also be used to obtain an aerial bone mineral density measurement similar to that in DEXA. What about the future? 
Bone mineral density, as we know, only accounts for a portion of bone strength, and there are many novel techniques looking at other parts of the equation, bone quality. Trabecular microarchitecture and bone porosity have been studied using MRI in hopes of assessing bone quality, and finite element analysis has been used to estimate the strength of bone and failure loads. These are only a few of the many exciting things we are, use, we are doing in imaging to assess bone strength. So in summary, osteoporosis is a disorder of reduced bone strength that predisposes to an increased risk of fracture. Fractures are associated with increased morbidity, mortality, and significantly adversely affect the quality of life. Currently, osteoporosis is most reliably diagnosed using DEXA. However, DEXA must be done in an accurate and reproducible manner to be a useful test. The most important job of a radiologist is to ensure the high-quality performance of this technique. In the future, we can look forward to many new novel techniques that go beyond bone mineral density to evaluate bone strength and osteoporosis.